The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm Lee Whitting. My wife Charlene and I recently watched in one evening the entire season of the Wachowski Brothers' new show on Netflix titled Sense 8. That is the word sense with a number 8 following. Basically, the show describes an evolution of the human species into small groups of 8 individuals around the world who share consciousness and the ability to travel out of body to help their soulmates when they get into trouble. I think it was a during the tenth hour of the show or thereabouts when these eight soulmates are sitting together in the concert hall listening to a Beethoven uh, piano concerto and each envisioning the intense details of their own births. While the show Sense8 is fiction, such in utero and birth memories can and do exist, and our guest today is researching just these kinds of reports. PMH Atwater is a world-famous investigator of near-death experiences, and has been researching and writing about the ramifications of near-death experience since her own three NDEs in the 1970s. Her research has been more extensive, her theories more expansive, and her teaching more dedicated than any other experiencer that I know. Her many books include Future Memory, Near-Death Experience, The Rest of the Story, The Big Book of Near-Death Experiences, Children of the Fifth World, A Guide to the Coming Changes in Human Consciousness, and uh, many other books as well. Um, Her latest book, Dying to Know You, Proof of God in the Near-Death Experience, will be the topic of an upcoming show here on NDE Radio. PMH, welcome back to NDE Radio. Well, it's fun to be here, Lee. (laughs) I think it's great. It's good to hear your voice. Uh, there have been many fictional shows based on the notion that a, that a new generation of children with psychic gifts are evolving. And one was a TV show not too long ago called Touch about a boy who appeared to be autistic but who read patterns and things that foretold events. Do you, do you think these shows, these quite popular shows on uh, in the movies and on TV, help raise society's consciousness about the possibilities? Well, it certainly wakes them up. Mm-hmm. And uh, my book, Children of the uh, the Fifth World, is a study about this, because it's true. Uh, we have a whole new generation. It's like an upgrade in the in the human family, um, where we we've got a whole new pattern, whole new pattern of, of DNA that's coming in, and it's it's global. It's in every country. It's in in every culture, uh, where these new kids coming in are not like uh, previous generations at all. And, and it, um, again, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, it, it's evolution at work. We're really seeing evolution in our time. And, and this is one of the things that, that got me um, oh, an, a number of years ago. I, I, I was, you know, I've been researching near-death kids, children who'd had a near-death experience, and I was beginning to notice that the children, everyday children, all kinds of children, normal children, were exhibiting the same or similar character, characteristics as near death kids, and and that just you know there's no way Lee that's not possible. Mm. So I I I flipped around and and did a separate study of just you know the new kids, uh, nothing to do with near death experiences. And and that's um, that's when I came up with these patterns, and they mm. are um, you know they're they're present everywhere. And, and if you want to read about that, certainly read Children of the Fifth World. But what I, what I found with near death kids, in other words, children who had a near death experience, um, you know that th- that was in my book, The New Children and Near Death Experiences, and um, you know, it was a very thorough study. It was a very deep study. Um, oh, well over 200 people in the study, uh, child experiencers. Uh, but what I found was the younger the child, the more affected they were. 
and um, with characteristics were, that were above and beyond even our new kids, any, you know, any kind of kids. And, and this has been bothering me for, lo, these many years, and I'm thinking, wait a minute here. Nobody else is doing anything about this. You know, other researchers, you know, come up with their uh, multiple quiz or, uh, you know, uh, the various kinds of questions and, and you know, they, they, they um, hire some kind of online survey company to carry their, their questionnaire and they, you know, they let people know volunteers needed, you know, um, mm. get a hold of this link and fill out this form and send it to us, and, and they do their little magical um, uh, mathematical ratio, and, and they come up with their paper, and they, uh, you know, they get their degree, or, or they complete whatever project they're after. Uh, but none of them, you know, going back in the 70s, Lee, none of them are, are digging deep and really observing the kids and talking to the parents and spending time. And, and none of them are using unbiased questions like, you know, did anything happen? Would you describe it to me? How do you feel? What's life right, like now? You know, just open-ended questions. And, and that's what I do. That's, a, that's my different kind of research. Yes. And I kept finding things that absolutely... Sometimes agreed with, but most of the time um, contradicted what our wonderful um, scientific um, research has been showing. And, you know, I want everybody in the audience to hear me right now when I say this. I deeply respect all our scientific researchers around the world. They've been done great work. You know, Kenring, Pim Van Lommel, Sam Parnia. You know, all of them, uh, Bruce Grayson, incredible people. But yeah, this little spanky person uh, uh, <laughs> called me, <laughs> comes <laughs> along and says, but look, look what you missed. Yeah. And, just, uh, yeah. Just, just following up on um, children's uh, spontaneous remarks, um, I know someone who uh, – who had a four-year-old say to them, oh, I can't wait until uh, I can talk to my mom's new baby because I'm forgetting what God is like and I want to talk to her about it. Yeah, right. You know, right. <laughs> yeah. because as, as we grow common. up, as we yeah. grow up, we lose those memories. Yeah, and, and a lot of our near-death kids uh, hold those memories a little bit longer than most kids do. Um but they're put down for it. You know, the parents don't want to hear it. There's just your imagination. You're obviously lying. So they put down these kids. And um, it's incredible that this this one child um, who had an experience in the womb before birth um, continued after birth and throughout her childhood um, to talk to the beings that she met over there. She they knew to see them, and they would they would tell her about what what's going to come in her life, and acquaint her with people that she was going to soon meet, and she would often talk to them. You know, she'd be walking on in the park. She'd be talking to these people that she could see, but nobody else could see. Huh. And and this is fairly common. It's not weird. Do you have any thoughts, PMH, on? When the soul might enter the fetus during the, you know, the, the nine months of birth? Well, you know, there's a lot of people birth. who, you know, and, and traditions. I think Edgar Casey said with the first breath, uh, a lot of traditions say that. Other traditions say, no, it begins, you know, a little bit before that. Other people say with, with you know, the um, it, uh, conception. Uh, as near as I can tell from my work, uh, I'm sure you've heard of announcing dreams. This, this is a yes. term given to, to those women, sometimes men too, who will get a dream like three months, maybe a year before there's any pregnancy. 
um, with that spirit coming in and announcing itself. So these are announcing dreams. Um, and these are global, everywhere, going back in history. So, so we know about announcing dreams. So obviously the soul is uh, or can be uh, aware of what might happen um, and, and start looking around and picking parents. So, so if you want to look at it in that way, the soul can be very active even years before there's ever a pregnancy. But when does the soul actually enter the body? Um, and again, as near as I can tell, the soul seems to go in and out and in and out. There's no, you know, we can't say with first breath. And in, and certainly with my research with, with uh, near-death kids, um, these kids are coming back um, in, in that book, um, The New Children and Near-Death Experiences, is the story of Carol Gray. And um, she was very aware weeks before her birth what was going on. And when her father came, uh, she was supposed to be stillborn. She was supposed to be dead in the womb. And, and the father uh, was convinced that this baby was his son. You know, he wanted his son. This was his son. And he was convinced that his wife had killed his son. You know, he blamed her for the fact that, uh, that um, the baby was dead. So he went out and got drunk, came home, beat up his wife, threw her across the room, and she landed... Or, or was thrown into the corner of a very hard old wooden table, and it split open her stomach. So they had to rush her to the hospital, um, and they did everything they could to save her. Nobody paid any attention to this dead fetus; just kind of threw it over on a countertop. And pretty soon, that little <laughs> that little thing started to breathe, and and so they're. Uh, they, they came back to the parents then and said, well, may we have permission to use medical experiments on this child because obviously the child isn't going to live anyway. Um, so may we have p permission to do medical experiments? The permission was given. They did that for 30 days. And mm. by golly, um, in, instead of being a horrific thing, it turned out to be a wonderful thing because the child then uh, became, you know, a real baby uh, mm. uh, that they could then raise. And well, so I, you know, hurrying up the story <laughs> when this when this when this little girl was two and a half years old uh, at a family meeting. In other words, you know, kind of like a Sunday family thing. And everybody was there in the living room. She walked up to her father, stuck out her finger in his face, and repeated to him every single thing he said to his wife that day, that night that he came home and beat her up. Wow. And, he just, and she described everything, all furniture in the room, what happened to the furniture, what he did to the furniture, what he did to her mother. Now, bear in mind, this is a stillborn, and we're talking um, maybe three, four weeks uh, before delivery. So this is a stillborn dead child in the womb that two and a half years later returned to her father every single thing he did. She was completely accurate. The parents were so stunned they couldn't talk. Nobody said anything because this was not talked about. The reason it wasn't talked about, Lee, is the mm. doctor was the father's drinking buddy. Uh. And, and all of this is in the book. All of this. The story is in the book. This story has been verified. So when we're talking about when does the soul enter the body, I think rather what we're really talking about is when does the soul stay in the body? 
Do you think it would be possible for a soul to visit various uh, infants in utero or uh, fetuses in utero to check out which what the situation is with each? Or is there a family connection that, that draws them toward the parents uh, regardless? Well, at this point in time, I'm going to have to say family connection because I haven't seen the other. So yes. I'm not going to make an opinion. Uh, I'm not going to give an opinion on something I haven't seen. Um, so I'm going to stay with what I've seen. Sure. And this is why I'm reprising my research. I'm going back. And, I, and I'm doing it again, only this time I'm focusing solely on experiences in the womb. Um, I'm really looking at the mother's pregnancy and how she was affected. I'm looking at birth trauma. I'm looking at preemies. Babies, toddlers, kids up to the age of five. My cutoff is the age of five. So if anybody in the listening audience wants to participate in this survey or or this this study, please, 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 please. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, (laughs) in your uh, your emailed request, uh, you said, and I'll, I'll read this for the audience, I'm looking for people who either remember being in the womb, birth trauma, being a preemie, passing through their mother's vagina, being a baby or a toddler or up to the age of five and somehow felt different because of that memory, different enough uh, that their uh, that their family, their school, their relationships, and if an adult, their adult lives seemed out of sync, foreign, or just didn't fit in with what they were told was normal. I think that's an amazing description of what... what uh... <laughs> yeah, and, and, you, and you can get this. Uh, you can get this paper on my website. You know, my website is www.pmhatwater.com. You know, one word, all lowercase. When you get on pmhatwater.com, scroll over to newsletter. Um, and, and, you know, you can certainly sign up for, for my free monthly newsletter. Please do that. But get into the archives. Mm. And in the archives, I think, too, back is this, um, is this call for participants. And it gives you all the instructions, everything there. You know, Lee, uh, the first time I did this work, it was one-on-one, mostly one-on-one. I did a lot of traveling then. Uh, um, Sometimes people would seek me out, but most of the time it's spontaneous. Um, I'd say over, well over 60% of of all of the researchers that I've contacted, and that's nearly 4,000 adults and children were all this spontaneous kind of thing or in meetings or in groups. Um, So I could then just sort of, you know, through through facial expressions and and the way I use my body and and, and just very open-ended questions, I could sort of coach or prod uh, information out of an individual. And, And most of the time I didn't have to. Because people wanted to talk about it. You know, they yes. really wanted to share. So this time, I don't have that privilege. I don't have the time. I don't have the money to be crossing the United States. You know, then it was part of my job to cross the United States and do all these. I worked for a telephone systems connect com- uh, interconnect company before the divestiture. So I was I was everywhere in all kinds of states. But this time... <laughs> I'm not working for that company anymore, (laughs) and I'm doing a lot of other stuff too, so I don't have that privilege. So I tried to draw up this this call for participants, and I I tried to just sort of say things that I hope will invite people to remember, to think, to connect, to describe, to expand, to elaborate. It is not a quiz. Some people come back, you know, <laughs> and, and, and some people send this to me and say yes or no, and I'm saying yes or no what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you have to expand and elaborate. Some people say I give you permission. I say, I, I, you know, give me permission to do what? You have to write it out, and, and that's all on this mm. one-page sheet of paper. Well, 
the originals one would would interviews would it would yeah would the uh, interviews um if if you conducted them through Skype you'd get uh, people's uh, facial expressions and so forth have you have well, you tried you that really watch the body you've got to watch the whole hmm. body you got to watch what they're doing with their legs their feet their hips where they're putting the weight on their hips uh you've really got to watch eyes and how people will react and respond when other people walk by. Um, so you're really doing a lot of observation work. Mm-hmm. You're not just looking in the face. You're watching that whole body. What are they doing with their joints, their shoulders, you know, and on. And uh, I, I'm really studying that individual, and I'm really hearing them. And Skype, um, Skype wouldn't cut it. So mm. I'm sending out this kind of open-ended request, saying, please, 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 you know, uh, <laughs> fill this out, do something, respond to it, and send me a drawing, if you will. And I don't care if it's sketchy. I don't care if it's stick figures. Just send me a drawing mm. uh, of your experience or your feelings or your thoughts. Um, you know, um, this is just so and do you know already, already, I've, I've had a couple dozen uh, 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 participants already. Mm-hmm. And, and with those couple dozen participants, I'm already starting to see things that are making me go, wait a minute here. With my original study of 277, I think it was 277, uh, child experiencers. One third had problems with alcohol within 10 to 12 years of their experience. We're talking children here who, when by the time they're in their teen years, are alcoholics because of what they went through, because nobody believes them, because they see ghosts all the time, they see disincarnates all the time, or often, and they don't know how to handle it, they don't know what it means. Uh, all they need is education, uh, but well, the, they're not they're not getting it. They may uh, also want to change their perception of reality because they know that this reality that everyone else is talking about isn't as real as something that they remember. Right. They need a mentor. They need somebody to talk to. They need somebody right. to read. You know, they're not getting it. Twenty-one percent tried suicide to get back to the other side. Wow. You don't find that with adults. With adults, maybe, you know, less than 5% will try suicide. Kids, 21%. Well, already, with these couple dozen that I've gotten, um, alcohol is not an issue. That They just automatically are staying away from it. And I'm going, hmm, this is interesting. But all but is- three have either attempted suicide, tried suicide, uh, talked about suicide, or wanted to commit suicide. The suicide problem, which which I thought was um, overestimated before, now I realize I wasn't anywhere near in the ballpark. It's a much bigger problem than I thought. And As a chap. I was going to say, as a chaplain in the hospital, I see more and more teenagers uh, attempting suicide. It's it's really sad. These are little kids. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's just like I'm going, what? Um. So, please help me, people who are listening to this show. I want to dig deeper into what's happening to kids now. I, I you know, I I just got back from the the. The, uh, near-death experiencers spiritual retreat in St. Louis, Missouri, which is wonderful, and um, heard again, saw again, child experiencers are not like adult experiencers or even teen experiencers. We cannot glump them all under the same umbrella because they don't fit. And one of the reasons I'm beginning to suspect why not is because 
those who have their experience from pre-birth, birth to the age of 15 months, that's the timely when the actual wiring of the, of the brain is determined. Synapse formation increases 20-fold. The brain uses twice the energy of an adult brain. So there's a lot going on in that brain and in the nervous system of these babies who are, mm. who are being hit, and I think that's an appropriate word, by the power punch of a near-death experience. And then from three to five years, remember my cutoff is at five, that's the temporal lobe development experiment, explore future patterns, continuity of environments. Do you know that the strongest evidence for genius in my work so far is from pre-birth, birth to the age of 15 months, the same time when the brain, uh, when the actual wiring of the brain is being determined, synapse formation increases 20-fold, and most alien, fairy, monster sightings typically happen with kids between the ages of three to five, the same with, with near-death experiences. Wow. And I'm asking, can we have temporal lobe expansion before temporal lobe development? You know, I, I, I'm really looking deep here, Lee. I can tell, VMH, you certainly are. Uh, we are almost out of time, and before before uh, we have to get off, um, perhaps you could tell us a little about um, the um, San Antonio convention that IENS is planning, and I um, assume you're going to be there and doing something. Yeah, this is always a big, big, big affair. So we're talking here September 3 through 6, or at least I'm calling it 3 through 6. Yes. Um, I, think, I think it's generally advertised as 4 through 6. But three through six, and it's it, it's on the Riverwalk. It's at a hotel on the Riverwalk. Um, mm-hmm, so that's going to be really lots of fun. Yeah, and um, and just some of the most exciting speakers we've ever had are coming. And you know, any any near death conference is a mind blower. I don't care who you are. I don't care whether you've had a near-death experience or not. I don't care if you're a medical person. I don't care if you're a doctor who totally believes the whole thing is a crock. Come. And you get, your mind will be blown. And what I tell near-death experiencers are, come and meet the rest of your family. Yes. Because you instantly, instantly lock in. You just do. Yeah. It's like coming home. Oh, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and San Antonio, Texas, who could, who could complain <laughs> about That's that right. wonderful place? Uh, please come. Everybody, please come. Uh, again, your mind will be blown. I'm not exaggerating. Yes. And they can find the details on the uh, IANS uh, website, IANDS.org, the dates, the uh, places to stay and all of that. Yeah. Uh, PMH, we're out, of, we're out of time for today, but I'm going to have you come back because we're going to talk about your new book in the next few weeks. Yeah. Um, but why don't you tell, uh, give the listeners your website again and, and let them know how they can get your books. Okay, it's www.pmhatwater.com. Com, just at and then water. Um, I have a free monthly newsletter. Um, you know, uh, you can subscribe to that by scrolling over to the newsletter. A lot of my books are um, are available on my website, but you can still get my books from Amazon.com or from your favorite bookstore. They can order them. They're still readily available, and certainly uh, the, the one that's Available now on Child Experiencers is the New Children and Near-Death Experiences. If you want to talk about our newest generation, then you want Children of the Fifth World. And they okay. are readily available. <laughs> Thank you, PMH. If you'd <laughs> like to, <laughs> and uh, we'll be back. Uh, t- we'll be talking again in the, in the next couple of weeks. 
uh, folks, if you would like to listen to this show again, the, uh, or the first show PMH did with us back in September 23rd of 2013, or her show of July 21st, 2014, or any other of our programs, please visit our website at nderadio.org. And for more information about IANDS, please check that website at iands.org. There will be information on that site about our upcoming Labor Day weekend conference, and uh, I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for listening.